they set the sort of the template for this um, uh, like trade or industry, I guess, uh, propaganda push. The next um, iteration we see on a on on a scale like this comes uh, in the 30s from the National um, uh, Manufacturers Association. Um, they they come out with a thing called, which I thought was fascinating, a tripod of freedoms, which made me immediately think like, did FDR get his four freedoms as a way of pushing back on this? But I, 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 it's a question for you, but, but, but uh, talk about the tripod of freedoms. And this is also the group that helped promote Reagan later a little bit, didn't it? Okay. But, but um, a, as an actor, I should say, or post actor, uh, but, but tell us about the, the NAM as it were in their uh, tripod of, of freedoms. The National Association of Manufacturers was, in the 1930s, the largest trade organization in the United States, representing manufacturing uh, businesses throughout the country. They were also a really important player in this story. So in the 1930s, they pick up on what NILA has done in the 20s, and they decide essentially to do it again, but to do it better and bigger. And one of the things that they realize, and we have the documents where they say this, so this is NAM officials, NAM staff discussing this problem. The problem is that the ideas that they're promoting are obviously self-serving. They obviously represent the interests of the ruling classes of what then was generally referred to as big business. Um, and in many cases, they're factually incorrect. We know that NILA paid people to lie. So the NAM staff think about this problem, they say, you know, what we need to do is we need to connect this argument to something that Americans love, something that all Americans cherish and care about, uh, so that it will have more resonance with the American people and it won't look like it's just biz big business supporting its own prerogatives. And the idea they land on is freedom. And I have to say, when we found this, it was pretty chilling because we had written about how the tobacco industry had done the exact same thing in the 1980s and 90s. Here was a trade organization doing this um, fully 50 years earlier. And so they developed this idea that they called the tripod of freedom. And they launched a massive propaganda campaign in the late 1930s and early 40s based on promoting the idea that American society was founded on three inextricable ideas, representative democracy, so far so good, uh, the civil and political uh, freedoms protected in the Bill of Rights, also good, but the third one, free enterprise. And they claim that because it's a tripod, if you compromise any one of these legs, the tripod will collapse. The whole of American society will collapse. Now, of course, the particular leg that they're trying to promote is the free enterprise right. leg. And this is interesting in two ways. First of all, they invent the term free enterprise. The historian Larry Glickman has written a great book just on that. Um, previously, people referred to it as private enterprise, but they say, oh, no, no, we don't want people thinking this is private. We want people thinking this is free. So they call it free enterprise, and then they create this story about how it's foundation to American culture. But it's not true. Free enterprise appears nowhere in the Declaration of Independence, nowhere in the Constitution, barely discussed, if at all, by founding fathers. Um, and in fact, if you look at the history of the 19th century, you see extensive government involvement in the economy, including protective tariffs that NAM had work to protect in the 19th century. So the whole story is a fabrication. It's an invention. It's a myth. But it's a way of connecting this story to something that Americans care about, which is freedom. It, uh, it, it is also just a great um, insight into how you do propaganda, exactly. right? Like you associate your little thing, maybe like, you know, it's only one third of the, the puzzle there. The other two things are like slam dunk, you know, it's apple pie and ma, you know, mom. And also, you know, the majority report, like those right. are the three things that people need in their life or something. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, 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 it's, and, and it's visual too, right? That you can imagine the tripod, one leg gets undermined and the whole thing falls. And it's interesting too, because we interviewed uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Jefferson Cowie, who wrote a book about freedom and its use within the context of, of, of white uh, people's resistance to federal power in the 1800s. And so like, you know, sort of mutating that, particularly around that time coming out of the 1920s, 
there's a lot of like, um, you know, sort of, that's a very loaded term, the idea of an infringement of freedom uh, in in society at that time. And then, you know, like it, it I, I it it just made me think of the four freedoms that that FDR used to push back on uh, corporate power uh, being speech again, which is noted worship, uh, which is, you know, uh, that civil and re- one of the uh, I guess the legs um, and then fear and want, uh, you know, specifically, it, it, there's a there, there, there's an attempt, I think, to reclaim uh, freedom from that initiative. I don't know that I, I guess for another another uh, person's book. But let's let's talk about like the the deployment of the American Family Robinson. I had never heard of that. And it was a radio show. I know what the Swiss Family Robinson is, <laughs> but um, this was another tool that they used. And what what I think also your book makes clear is that like down the road, when we see the kneecapping of unions uh, by things like Taft Hartley and you understand that like they, they basically, there was no mechanism to push back on these organized corporate entities anymore uh, because they inhibited the ability of labor to which was the only obvious, like, sort of, like, I guess, bulwark against this, um, to amass the power or to deploy the power that uh, that corporations were at that time. But I'm right. sorry, so, yeah, that's yeah, a lot. There was there, a, but... There's a couple of things there, but I, I can handle it. So I think a, a key part of this story is a is a strong anti-union activity. And so the National Association of Manufacturers and their allies are extremely anti-union. And they try to use the freedom argument against unions to say that unions are an inappropriate infringement on freedom um, and that therefore the government should in fact intervene to stop unions. I mean, there's obviously a lot of hypocrisy in this whole story because these folks are perfectly happy to have government when it serves their interest, but fight against government when it doesn't. But to bring back to the with the the American family, Robinson. So as you said, a key part of the argument is that we see this program, and as you said, it is a program, it functions on multiple levels. So one piece is influencing academia and recruiting experts to give the story credibility. A second part is politics, fighting in the political realm. And a third part is mass culture. And in some ways, the mass culture part of the story is the most upsetting because it's the most obviously propagandistic. Well, the academia part is bad, too. But I mean, the political part, obviously, these people have a right to their views and they have a right to be heard in the political arena. But they also massively propagandize the American people through popular culture. And one important part of the story is a radio program, again, mostly forgotten today, but was very popular at the time called the American Family Robinson. This was a program that was created by the National Association of Manufacturers as part of their propaganda campaign, as part of the Tripod of Freedom campaign. And the idea was to get the message out to millions of Americans in their home where they would listen to this radio program. The program was not identified as being a product of NAM. Uh, The listener wouldn't really know where this program had come from, but each week they would hear didactic stories about individual enterprise, uh, the sanctity of the nuclear family, and the importance of keeping the government out of the marketplace. So it was a highly anti-New Deal, anti-FDR, deeply propagandistic radio program. You can find episodes online to listen to, uh, and my students and I did. And this program, we know, was syndicated by over 300 radio stations around the United States. It was supplied by NAM free of charge. So you can imagine if you're a radio station in a small town, you don't have a big budget. And now this radio program, which is well produced and interesting and well written, comes to you free of charge. You say, great, I put this on the air. And you do. 